Yay, okay. Step by step. All right. It continues so you don't get bumped off. <laughs> um, all right, here's our artwork for POE 2022. And by the way, if you're interested in um, being on the show committee or you have any suggestions for the committee, please email me, vp at orchidsanfrancisco.org or Corey at orchidsanfrancisco.org. We would love to have you. Um, we'd love to have some volunteers or just hear your lovely suggestions. Here is Shawnee's. Um, that on our slide because we don't have the slideshow anymore. Could you put your information in the chat so people can pick it up? Because you said it very quickly and we couldn't all get it. I will when we're, I'm uh, off stage. Absolutely. <laughs> um, you have to sorry, share. sorry, but it's really hard to share and have the Zoom going at the same time and the, the uh, projector. We'll get better as we go. Let me see if I can put it back. Sorry, that was my fault. No, okay. So, Zoom screen is. The tab is, tab is the tab is uh, the blue one. This one. Nope. No. Just kidding. Oh, it's behind. I see it behind. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Oh. Okay, so start sharing. To record, you have to stop sharing. So now you can share the, the green one you were on. At the bottom, what the share screen? Uh huh. Just yeah, I just that. have to select my name right now. Oh, okay. okay. It's okay, do you, technical. do you see the slideshow? On uh, the yes, we see the agenda and announcements screen. Fabulous. There is the artwork again. Let's show it real quick for the Zoom call. Beautiful. Um, I'll go over Shawnee's um, bio when she's ready to talk, or right before. Um, this was sent out in an email, um, but if you need it again, I'm just going to quickly go by this screen. Please let me know. And again, I'll be sharing my information in the chat later, or you can just info, uh, email the info at Francisco email address. Uh, more information about the Netherlands trip. Um, again, we've showed this quite a few times, but um, so we'll just go through this pretty quickly. It's gonna be really fabulous. There is a new orchid marketplace for AOS. Um, pretty cool, there's lots of vendors on there. They have some vouchers they were doing as well. Um, highly recommend. Two, the last two months, the new one and the last month AOS new, uh, uh, magazines. If you want one, take it. On the back table, and there's also if you're not a member and want to join, there's stuff back there about that. Um, we are taking COVID precautions for our in-person meetings, so if you're interested, um, we do make sure you are showing your vaccination card and answering a pre-screening um, questionnaire. If you are concerned, please let us know, and we can uh, answer your questions. That okay, um, Lynn. Are you ready for? Oh, am I going first? Sure. Yes. I think so. It's still judging. And if you're not ready, we can do the input. It says you cannot start share screen share while other participant is sharing. <laughs> so I will. Working on it. Working on it. <laughs> nope. There's a lot easier to let me do this from home. Yeah, but it never goes well with you. Okay, try again, Lynn. And let us know if you want to do the in person first. 
Oh, What's happening? Do you I see think. anything? I see yep. Yep. What do you see? Right. We got your show and tell. Ooh. Okay, October hey, 5th, I'm sorry? Uh, Renata Johnson. It, it looks like uh, you're, you're not, you know, like you're in your view, uh, you're not okay. in the uh, presentation view. Okay. Lele Tenebrosa. Okay, hold on. Okay, so you see Lelia Tenebrosa yes. without, without my notes underneath? With your notes. No, with your notes off to the well, top. Well, let's just see if I can fix that. Hold on. I may have to call for my expert. You know, I always have to, right? Did that do anything? Or does it go, go to display settings at the top of your screen? I think that's where you set it. Uh, look at this Layla Tenebrosa. We just do it. He's discovered in a portion of his job. Its habitat has completely been completely uh, destroyed. Could be underneath her picture because different screens. Uh, I have to. It's only grown in culture. Conservation. <laughs> It's never been, it's, uh, it's habitat has been totally logged. Hey, Jeff, we can hear you. Can you mute yourself? So they're seeing it with my notes. Okay. Here's my expert. Okay. You've, yeah. you've got some options down at the bottom. Take a look at what they Take do. Take a look at, if not the, that's where it should be. So you, you've got screen one clear. So you want to go to screen two? And now they Ho should host see. Host can mute all of us except for our speaker. Now they should be seeing. What do you see now? Same thing. Same thing. With my notes? Yes. yes. Notes of the, of the next slide, yeah. Just go ahead and do it. There. Now you got it. Now you got it. All righty. So, okay. You don't want to go back to. And remember, do your slide changes from here. Yep. Thank you. Okay. You Thank go. you. Thanks, so Tom. Not, sure. Happy not anniversary. Flashing, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, sweetie. Okay, so we have another great virtual show and tell tonight. We have 43 um, orchid photos, which is less than we had when we didn't have also live show and tell. But we have photos from 15 contributors, and I really appreciate their taking the time to photograph and send me photographs. So Thank you. Let's get started in the order in which I show them is the order in which I receive them. So as you all just saw, this is Renata Johnson's Lelia tenebrosa. She was the early bird this month. And uh, this is a Brazilian species with large six or seven inch flowers, bronze sepals and petals and a dramatic magenta lip with dark purple stripes to lure the pollinator inside there. The habitat used to be limited to a small area in Southern Espirito Santo, Brazil, but Francisco Miranda reported in 1990 that the habitat has been completely destroyed and tenebrosa is no longer found in nature, which is a sad state of affairs, but fortunately it's found in a lot of collections. So it is not extinct in cultivation. Hopefully it can re be reestablished in the wild. So remember this picture because we're gonna see hybrid with it now. This is Renata's primary hybrid of Lelia tenebrosa crossed with Lelia leopoldii, which is also known as uh, Cattleya tigrina. So this is a primary hybrid, meaning it's two species crossed. This is a gorgeous flower, and I'm surprised that the hybrid has never been registered. Both of the parents have beautifully um, bronzy petals and sepals with that magenta lip. The lip of Tenebrosa, we saw that trumpet shape, and this hybrid has that same uh, trumpet shape characteristic as well. Both of the parents are Brazilian species found at elevations with um, intermediate to cool temperatures and bright light. So this is a possible candidate for outdoor growing in the Bay Area with protection from uh, rain and from freezing. Renata also shows us this stunning Epicatlea Middleburg Madge with magenta. We have a lot of purple tonight in the show. Yes. Magenta, no, magenta purple flowers and a deeper purple lip. 
The hybrid was registered in 1982 by Madge Orchids in Florida when it was awarded an award of merit or AM with 15 flowers. And it looks like Renatus has many more than 15 flowers and buds on a single upright up right inflorescence. So this is beautifully grown Renata. Given the parentage, uh, this orchid needs bright indirect light to bloom this well in intermediate or household temperatures. So Renata says it's a very reliable bloomer and it is lovely. Renata hits the applause meter with this one. Everybody clap. She has <laughs> nine beautifully displayed huge blooms on um, this um, hybrid of BLC Silk Road by BLC Golden Zell. This is another um, unregistered hybrid with very complex heritage, as you can see. The flowers are really beautifully displayed on this plant outside the foliage, and they're all facing outward uh, with fabulous ruffles and flourishes. The dramatic purple lip is uh, heavily influenced by Cattleya dawiana in the background. You can see in that uh, pie chart that dawiana is a, a big percentage of it. Um, these complex hy Cattleya hybrids typically prefer bright indirect light, intermediate temperatures down to 58, 60 degrees at night, but they can probably adapt to a wider temperature range. Lisa Perla, I saw her on tonight, shows us her hybrid of LC Peter Fleur by Cattleya Bicolor with nice AOS awards to both parents. And the hybrid was just registered in 2014 since her plant tag was written. It's now called Lelio Cattleya Sunset Constellation. If you want to update your name tag, Lisa. The name Sunset is appropriate with these uh, peach hued kind of fall sunset tones. And with this parentage, it would be a good candidate for uh, windowsill growing. And our president, Jeff Harris, sent this to me from Africa where he was on September 21st with the following message, quote, my first orchid sighting in Kenya on a tree outside the spa at Lewis Safari Camp. So you can see we're really roughing it here. I thought it was Sertorchus arcuata, but I posted on Facebook and I stand corrected. Lawrence Grubler said it is Rangaris armaniensis. That's the end of his quote. It's clearly an epiphyte. We can see it wrapping itself around the rough bark of this tree that it's growing on with really thick fleshy roots. The Baker notes on this says that the plants appear to occupy two very different um, habitats and they could be found in montane forest or in open woodlands between 3,500 and 8,500 feet. So that's a pretty good temperature range, but they're always in filtered or diffuse light, which is why this one's thriving near the ground and not up in the treetop. It is fragrant and there's a long slender pendant spur that you can see at the base of the lip that suggests that it's pollinated by a night moth. And this is very cool, Jeff. Thanks for sending it. Judy Carney shows us Epidendrum porpax. Epidendrum is a very large genus found throughout the tropical Americas. And this little gem is found from Mexico to Brazil in wet montane and cloud forests at elevations from 1,000 to 6,000 feet. It's a mini miniature sized hot to cool growing mat forming um, epiphyte. So it is a mini miniature, but as you can see, it's best grow mounted so the rhizomes can creep around the mount. So it's low, but it's creeping all around the mount, mount here for Judy. It blooms twice a year for her, spring and fall with these little shield-like glossy flowers and the name Porpax actually means, means shield-like. This is Judy Sophronitis or Cattleya pygmaea. Uh, there are 10 dwarf distinctively red species in the genus Sophronitis found in Brazil and Paraguay. Recent DNA research has moved this genus entirely to Cattleya, but to the human eye, this genus is distinct in both the plant and flower morphology. So many orchidists are keeping them seg segregated as I am. As you can see from Judy's plant tag here, there's also confusion between the species Pygmaea and Montecara, uh, Pygmaea being the smaller of the two as the name suggests. So regardless of the name, this is a beautifully grown and flowered plant, Sophronitis are not easy. And this is a wow of a tiny gem. It grows um, cool down to about 42, 40 degrees. Seems to bloom both in bright light and, and light shade. This is really just gorgeous. This is Judy's Phalaenopsis balina. Her plant tag says it's an F5. And what that means is that it's been line bred for five generations by AA orchids. The success of breeding is focused on getting the plant bigger 
The flower is bigger, fuller, flatter flowers with really clear color differentiation so they're not muddied together. This is a great example of uh, successful breeding. Even though the breeder has been crossing it back to itself, it's not a hybrid because it's never been crossed with any other species. So this is a hot growing species native to Borneo. It's found in shady, humid, swamp, humid, swampy forests, and it's a pendant grower. You can see those leaves hanging down. So it's much happier mounted as Judy shows it here, rather than in a pot. It likes medium to low light. So try it on a windowsill if you can give it enough um, humidity and, and good air movement. Tom Pickford shows us Catlea seagulls Tim. This is a second generation hybrid bred for the miniature size, uh, flat flower, clear colors, and the ruffled lip. These little mini cats are perfect windowsill candidates. Um, Alan Cotchoy says a lot of them available, as does Fred Clark of Scent SVO. Uh, they need medium to bright light, household like temperatures, though. Tom Pickford does grow this well in his cool greenhouse with nighttime temperatures into the low 40s. So it's pretty temperature tolerant. It's just a little charmer. This is Tom's Cattleya Bob Betts. As you can see, it's a complex hybrid. And this is a classic cross made back in 1950. Tom does a great job growing these big frilly Cattleyas in his cool greenhouse. This one is about um, two thirds Cattleya mossy in its background. And that's where it gets this fabulous size. Uh, the flowers are about six to seven inches with beautiful trumpet shaped lip and fabulous fragrance that just about fills the greenhouse. Cool to intermediate temperatures, bright indirect light and regular feeding while it's actively growing. When the days are cooler and shorter, less frequent watering and voila, we have a beautiful blooming. So compare that to this, another one of Tom's saucer sized Cattleyas. This is Cattleya Marjorie Hauserman, York. It's another classic hybrid made in the 1960s. And though even though Lodigesii and Mosii make up about 70% of its parentage, they must have used alba forms of those parents to get this alba progeny because there's no um, anthocyanin and no red pigment in this at all. And even the awarded clone called York had a deep yellow throat. This one is really much more albinistic. This is a lovely plant. And Tom says it has four blooms and one inflorescence with um, 16 and six inch, excuse me, six inch flowers, very lovely. And this is Tom's ginormous Danhopa oculata. It has pendant inflorescences which grow downward from the base of the pseudobulbs. So you can see we're looking up from the bottom of it. Tom's growing it in a plastic basket with large spaces for the inflorescences to poke down through. Each flower lasts just five or six days, but they're at least five inches and they're, they're wildly fragrant kind of like vanilla. This is a species found from Mexico down to Brazil, elevations from 1300 to about 6,500 feet. So that tells us it would adapt well to a pretty wide range of temperatures. It can grow outdoors in the Bay Area, well protected from winter rains. And Stanhopas love to hang outdoors in the shade of a big oak tree in the summer in the Bay Area. Roberta Fox shows us another Stanhopa. This one's Wardii. And she says it's an extremely, extremely reliable fall bloomer. It currently has fall spikes, four spikes, pardon me, blooming one at a time. So the show has been going on for several weeks, even though each one only lasts a few days. The flowers actually open with a pop sound and they have just a wonderful perfume. This is a species native to Central America from Honduras and down into South America, uh, Colombia and Venezuela, found at a wide range of elevations. Roberta grows this on her Costa Mesa, Mesa patio. And it's just hard to beat Stan, Stan Hopias or Stan Hopas for the beautiful, odd complexity of these flowers. If you stare at that flower and try to figure out where the parts are, look for the, um, the dorsal sepal and the petals and the lateral sepals and the lip, it's pretty complicated. This is Roberta's Neoconioia monophylla. This is named for a Belgian botanist whose name was Celeste Danconio. This is a miniature orchid from the Blue Mountains of Jamaica, uh, the home of the famous coffee. And it's a member of the Cattleya tribe. Roberta's growing it in a two inch plastic basket placed into a three inch clay pot for the weight or for stability. She grows it on her Southern California patio 
shady and quite damp. This summer was fairly cool. And she says the plant seems to have appreciated that because it's really putting on a great show. This is, this is a unique flower, really beautiful. And Roberta shows us Phalaenopsis hieroglyphica. You can see the hieroglyphics on the um, marking on the petals. This species is native to the Philippines. It blooms repeatedly on each spike, but it does so only once a year. So you don't cut them off. And the bloom flush gets better each year as the older spikes are joined by newer spikes. And this is, this is really a beautiful blooming. Roberta grows it in her greenhouse as it is a warm grower, but would probably also well do, do well on a windowsill with medium diffuse light. This is beautiful. This is Roberta's Dracula Cordobe. So look at this picture, thinking that you're looking at it, looking up from the bottom, because that's what we are. And you can see circling around that basket, there are six flowers which open simultaneously, and that's a record for her. Let's hit the applause meter on that one. The six beautiful little faces looking down at us. You can see the flowers are arrayed in, arrayed in a circle hanging down from the bottom of that basket. Roberta says the flowers open, open out flat in the cool of the morning, then they partially collapse in the heat of the day, only to reopen the next morning, which is pretty cool. This behavior makes it really hard to bring Draculas to meetings or to judgings because they typically have to be transported in a, a cooler or an ice chest to uh, maintain, maintain the temperature and the humidity they want. This one's native to southwestern Ecuador, elevations up to about 1,000 meters, uh, 3,500 feet, making it fairly heat tolerant, more so than many of the, the uh, others in this genus. This is Andrea Lodate Cymbidium Dayanum, which she recently purchased on the SFOS field trip to Oakville Ranch. This is a cool growing species from Southeast Asia, and we don't see it very often. It grows beautifully outdoors in the Bay Area, protected from winter rains, hoping that we get some winter rains. It likes uh, light as bright as possible, just short of burning the leaves, and significantly less water during the winter when the days are shorter and cooler. The flowers are very fragrant, they're about two and a half inches across. And this is just a charming little cymbidium species. If you don't have it, uh, you have space for it. This is Andrea's Yamadara or Encyclevola, Sammy Evans, which he purchased last October. I'm guessing that was at the San Francisco sale. And this is the first time it's bloomed for her with more buds still to open. We can see them behind there. This is an interesting hybrid as we can see in the family tree. Um, the result is these just delicate little three inch and sickly alike star shaped flowers, lime green, lime green with a beautiful lip, veined purple, more purple for us tonight. Susan Anderson shows us Arangus articulata. Arangus is a genus of about 50, 55 species found in Africa and Madagascar. And this one, articulata, is a small epiphytic, uh, warm to hot growing species found growing on the trunks and major branches of trees at elevations um, from sea level to about 6,000 feet. Susan puts on this spectacular display, hers puts on this spectacular display for her each fall with showy pendant inflorescences. There's 17 flowers on this spike. And the flowers are about two inches across, plus that long nectary or spur hanging behind it. They're scented um, jasmine-like, and the flowers are long-lived, they're waxy. Susan grows it in her intermediate greenhouse with night temperatures not below 58 degrees. She gives it lots of water while it's growing, uh, much less water for three or four months in the winter. This is really beautiful, graceful. This is Susan's BLC Fred S. Misbach, a recent Carter and Holmes cross of Cattleya or BLC Adisto Barney Garrison, which has an HCC award, crossed with BLC Lynn Spooner Mendenhall. The hybrid was registered as Fred S. Misbach in 2014, and it has not been awarded to date. These flowers are huge. They're almost six inches across, and they're dominated by that large frilly lip with gold veining in the interior to attract the pollinator to come hither. Uh, looks like there are four flowers on this, and they're really nicely displayed above the foliage. Wowzer, this is nice. And this is Susan's Phalaenopsis summera. This is a primary hybrid of two species found in Sumatra and Borneo. We earlier saw Judy Carney's Phalaenopsis polina, which is the seed parent of this hybrid, um, and Violacea is the pod parent. 
The result is the stunning two inch fragrant flowers, very long uh, magenta red lip and interesting rings of striations around the interior of the dorsal sepal and the petals. Susan Gross's plant mounted on a hardwood mount and the leaves are large and pendant so they are able to, to dangle down from her mount. It enjoys intermediate conditions and our good Bellinus water. This is Jeffrey Doney, I saw him on tonight. Paphiopetalum philippinens. Jeffrey says he got the plant uh, when it was not in bloom at the San Francisco orchid show 12 years ago. And the tag said Paphstonii, which this clearly is not. Uh, it's not hard to guess where this orchid comes from, Philippines. It usually grows in leafy debris on limestone cliffs and boulders, often in fairly open and exposed uh, locations from sea level to about uh, 1700 feet on several of the Philippine islands. So in cultivation, it prefers warm temperatures and growers report that it needs 10 to 11 hours of bright light each day to initiate blooming. Jeffrey says it sends two to three spikes up every year and those graceful flowers last a couple of months. It's really a favorite. This is Jeffrey's Cochleanthes discolor. There are just four, four species left in this epiphytic genus Cochleanthes found in the tropical Americas, and they all need shady, very humid environment to bloom as well as Jeffrey's is. This is a spectacular blooming with flowers all around the perimeter. So let's hear some applause for this one. Jeffrey says he bought this curious orchid from Mary Nisbet at one of her California orchid Bellina sales many years ago and it blooms two or three times a year with a striking shape and these petals are typically reflexed or rolled back like this. The name discolor means two colored and it clearly is that. The uh, clonal name Lil Severin. Uh, Lil Severin was a very long time member of San Francisco Orchid Society. She received an, an award of merit of 80 points on this in 1989 with just two flowers. This is nice, Jeffrey. So keep this one in mind because we're gonna see a hybrid made with this later in the show. Winnie Wang shares with us her Cymbidium ensifolium, generally found growing as a terrestrial orchid in a fairly wide area of Southeast Asia. It's a hot to cool growing species with small pseudobulbs or almost no pseudobulbs visible. In its habitat, the low average temperatures um, do not go below about 52 degrees. So, uh, would need careful protection if grown outdoors in the Bay Area, but it is a delicate and delightful addition to any collection. It's not, not huge like a lot of the cymbidiums, but the flowers are about three inches across. They're jasmine scented and um, just point of interest, Ken and Amy Jacobson received the most recent award on their ensifolium in 2019 with five flowers. Dale Martin shows us another, another one of his weird and wonderful bulbophyllums. This is Bulbophyllum aparchii, Okayama. It's also known as Bulbo longifolium. This species is in the seropetalum section of Bulbos, which uh, means that the flowers form a beautiful circular whorl or umbel around the, the inflorescence. And the inflorescence emerges from the base of the pseudobulb. Eberhartii is found in Myanmar, Thailand, Vietnam, um, Southern China, at elevations from about 3,300 to 5,000 feet. So it's a cool growing epiphyte, not cold, but cool. Dan Newman, our friend who owns Hanging Gardens in Pacifica, where we have our, we've had a couple of sales for San Francisco. Dan received the um, Certificate of Horticultural Merit from AOS in 2001, and he gave it the clonal name Okayama. What we mostly see in each of these 14 flowers in front of us is the two large dorsal sepals. They're about an inch and a half long and they're fused together below the hinged lip. I think this photo really beautifully captures the uh, essence of this one. This is Dale's Vanda Omar Padron, a little more purple for us. I don't think we see enough Vandas on the show and tell table, probably because they're generally pretty large plants. They require warm temperatures and also very bright light to flower well. Uh, they do love to hang up by the greenhouse roof. So most in-home growers struggle to bloom them well unless they give over their entire humid bathroom to them. This is a complex hybrid registered by RF Orchids. That's Robert Fuchs um, in Florida in 2011. The purple color I think is just stunning and 
that multitude of spots all over the sepals and petals, and also that really bright purple lip. This is Dale's Phalaenopsis mutuo gelb eagle crossed with a species called Amboinensis. Um, what's the spectacular color and that glossy texture this hybrid has produced? It's not yet been registered, and we'd love to see this on the judging table, Dale. The complexity of the lip adds interest with the, the spots and the uh, pink or magenta on the, on the inside. Uh, this is a very full, flat flower. I, I think this, this gets a wow award. Wow. Wow. So we just saw um, Cochleothes discolor. This is Dale's, let's see if I can say this, Warscatoria La Fontaine. This is a primary hybrid, meaning that it's a cross of just two species of that Warswick Ciela or Cochleanthes discolor that we just saw from Jeffrey Doney. That's crossed with Pescatria violacea, which you see in the bottom left. Um, it was registered by Marcel Le Couf in France in 1993, but it's never been awarded in the United States. This is just a surprisingly lovely flower. Um, I won one on the Sonoma um, Orchid Society Opportunity Table two years ago, and it does not have this beautiful purple lip. So if you're a lover of purple, Carolyn, Andrea? Yeah. We have lots of purple to look at tonight. Continuing the purple theme, this is Tanya Lamb showing us Vanda Costylis or Vanda Lucneri. This is a very rewarding grower and bloomer, which would be great in any collection, wherever you grow it. It's a primary hybrid of Vanda Celestis, which gives it that purple coloration, um, and Neophonicia falcata, which we all know and love. And that gives this loose, serious, um, charming kind of starry shape and the small size. This plant is typically less than a foot tall. It needs bright indirect light, warm to cool temperatures. It's not very fussy, but lots of water during the summer months when it's actively growing. It will continue to add new fans of foliage at the base, which will then bloom and add to the wow factor of this lovely little orchid in successive seasons. This is Tanya Lamb's Brassavola Medosa, Susan Fuchs, which has received the highest quality award in FCC or first class certificate from the AOS. This is also a great windowsill sized plant and easy to bloom and thrive. It's generally less than a foot tall. It forms clumps of growths uh, with little short rhizomes in between them. The flowers are three or four inches. They're beautifully fragrant at night because it is pollinated by a night moth. It's a species from Mexico and Central America, where it grows in low-lying coastal region, regions, either in trees or on exposed. So that tells us it prefers bright indirect light or just a bit of direct in warm to hot temperatures. Very rewarding little addition to any collection. And this was probably available from a lot of vendors while it's in bloom right now. This is Tanya's Cattleya Lodergesii, which is another classic Cattleya species discovered over 200 years ago by the British orchid collector named Modigis. It occurs from Bahia, Brazil, south to Argentina and Paraguay, and it's found both in the sun and shade as a, it's medium sized, it's cool to warm growing, but it's a bifoliate, epiphyte or lithophyte. So bifoliate is a key word here. Orchids that have the cattleyas that have two leaves, bifoliate on each pseudobulb as opposed to the unifoliates that have one leaf on the pseudobulb, the bifoliates are much fussier about being repotted, and they should only be repotted when new root tips. Yeah. Otherwise, it will pout, and it might take it a couple of years, but it will die. These flowers are about four inches. They're long-lasting, beautifully fragrant, particularly at midday. And this is a great, again, this is a great orchid for every collection. This is Tanya's spectacularly bloomed Miltonia Juicy Fruit with beautiful bubblegum colors. This is a complex hybrid with all of the classic Miltonias in its family tree. The cross was made by great hybridizers, Jay McCull James McCulley and Glenn Barfield of Orchid Works in Hawaii in 2016. Tanya's is a large specimen sized plant, but uh, generally it's smaller and a good window soap candidate in medium light intermediate temperatures. It certainly puts on a beautiful show. Yes. Kay Klum shows us Sologeny. Monilorechus. Sologeny is an interesting genus. It has about 200 species found, found in all four climates, hot, warm, cool, and cold. So you have to be careful to learn what climate each species 
comes from is they may not tolerate different conditions as I have learned from experience. Worm growing species like Pandorata speciosa, the worm growing species need no winter rest, but the colder growing species need a dry rest in the winter. This species Monilorhachis is from Borneo and it is a worm grower, so it needs year round water. The dark green foliage has a bronze cast and is lovely even when the plant is not in bloom, but the one inch kind of translucent salmon colored flowers are, are really charming. And K is Bulbophyllum hirundinus. It is in the seropetalum se section of Bulbophyllum as well, with that whorl or umbel of flowers um, around the end of the rachis or the stem. As we can see in the left-hand photo, K's three-inch ruler is beside the mount, showing that this is a, a very much a miniature species. It's found in Vietnam and Taiwan. The long part that we see in this photo is the two elongated lateral sepals, which are fused together partway down. All of the action place, takes place up at the top, where we see the little hairy dorsal sepal and petals surrounding the hinged lip. K grows this in the intermediate greenhouse, but most bulbos can be grown in the home with medium light household temperatures and they're all really interesting and unique and rewarding. Go for bulbos. This is a new um, genus to me. This is her Volusiella modii. There are six miniature fan-shaped species in this African genus, Volusiella, named for the 19th century South African collector, collector Harry Bolas. Modii is a mini miniature, as we can see with Kay's three-inch ruler on the left-hand photo. It's found in woodlands with high rainfall um, at elevations up to 6,000 feet. So in cultivation, it needs frequent and good quality water, cool to warm temperatures, and low light. Kay grows it in the intermediate greenhouse where it produced several many flowered inflorescences for her this month. It has two ranks or rows of flowers along each stem. This is a unique little orchid and a delight to see. And Kay's epidendrum embryi. K generally favors miniature orchid species, but this epidendrum is an exception growing on her back landing outdoors in San Francisco. It's an Ecuadorian species found in subtropical montane forests at elevations from 6,500 to 9,000 feet. So that tells us it's a cool grower and K's plant shows that it can be very successfully grown outdoors in the Bay Area. It can bloom several times a year on terminal inflorescences at the top of the in top of the plant. And these pumpkin colored flowers are about, each about three quarters of an inch long. Deborah Vale Squalders shows us Burragiera Nellie Eisler Swiss Beauty, which she grows outdoors in San Francisco under her camellia tree. Burragiera is an intergeneric hybrid. The orchid genera, uh, between the orchid genera Cochleota, Miltonia, Odontoglossum, and Oncidium. It was grown for the first time by the American Albert Burrage, whom it was named after in 1927. Nellie Eisler is a complex hybrid, as we can see from the family tree. It was one of the first orchids which captivated me with that stunning flat cerise colored flower. It's often available in the trade this time of year and it's worth looking for also. Deborah shows us this interesting Oncidium hybrid. If you look at it closely, it looks to me like it has a a tiger's face in the center of the flower. These Oncidium hybrids are available in the market at this time of the year because they're in bloom and they're great plants for the in-home grower because they need intermediate or household type temperatures and bright filtered light. The flowers are long lasting. They're often, fr often fragrant. You need one. Deborah shows us Oncidium or Gomza alosuca. And this clone Claire received an AM from, the, from AOS in 2013 at the San Diego show. The dark brown radiating, radiating out from the center of the lip and contrasting with the daffodil yellow, I think makes this a really charming little flower. And Deborah says it has a wonderful chocolate scent. This is a nice blooming. Good job, Deborah. Now Martin just came in at the last minute with this BLC Sea God Gold Quasiem. And I added this in because it's a hybrid created by Sea God Nursery, which many of us knew it was owned by Raymond Burr, whom uh, we more <coughs> mature members will remember as Perry Mason. Raymond Burr was um, an avid orchidist and hybridizer, and he owned a small island off the coast of Southern California where he pursued his orchid hobby. 
He died a number of years ago, but his partner, uh, Robert Benveniz and Francisco, are still going strong in Palm Desert today, according to Dale. The five big frilly flowers on Dale's plant are just gorgeous. This is my Cattleya Memoria Dina Izumi, which is a cross of Cattleya chocolate drop by Barbara Kirsch. With the help of Susan Anderson and Judy Carney, I bought two plants of this from Brookside Orchids at Orchids in the Park in October of 2013. And a few days later, I used them to make my, make my wedding bouquet, which you see on the left, on October 5th, 2013. So today is our wedding anniversary and our wedding orchid blooms every year without fail for our anniversary. Yay. <laughs> and since nobody sent me any pet orchid photos for this month, this, uh. will be great. this uh. is now 11 week old English Springer Spaniel puppy, Sasha, admiring our anniversary flowers, the way she admires everything by mouth. I have sacrificed only part of one flower to get this photo. <laughs> She's got her mouth open on it. Aww. Unless you'll be seeing lots of photos of this little cutie as she grows up, unless you all send me pet and orchid photos. So that's mm -hmm. all for tonight. And again, thank you to each of you who has taken the time and effort to send me show and tell photos. I really appreciate it. She's darling. Great Happy job. anniversary. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Great table. It is a great table, and I'm sure there's more great, great ones live at the at the uh, hall tonight. Thank you. Hey, Lynn. We have some awards um, coming in now. Let's <laughs> get in the back. Let's get a little. Well, we have two awards this month. If you guys had were here last month, it's sort of like a deja vu, right? This is a frag. This is a frag of Velva uh, Meyer. Okay, this is a Kavakia hybrid. It actually received a HCC uh, 78 last month. And you should have the question of wait a minute, I saw each plant can only be judged one time. That is true. Last month, we awarded the previous flower. This flower wasn't available. And this month, this brand new flower, which has not been judged before, got an upgrade, and it is now uh, an AM of 81. So Japheth gets to pay for AOS awards twice. <laughs> can you show us the plant we're working on it can you, can you bring it over here so we can sure. sorry oh. where do you want me to can you come just around me yeah it's it's like a, a right where I'm standing, right so here. we need to be a little closer mm -hmm. right, right, here. Right, here. right here right here yeah in front of that really weird See looking thing standing? right to him yeah. yeah. me. Right there there and the okay, okay. So, this way. Oh, yeah. so I want to go here. <laughs> to my left. And zoom in on that. And just bring it straight towards my hand. Here. Why don't you do it? Because you know what you're doing when I don't. Uh, oh wow. Nice. Really nice. Mm -hmm. nice. Gorgeous. Beautiful. Thank you. Pretty gorgeous. Okay. Now will it follow me? No. no. It won't. We've lost the camera control. <laughs> oh, well. This is epidendrum. Poor packs. And for those of you who grow this, you may say, oh yeah, but I've seen them covered in flowers. Yes. It's quite common that these plants get quite large in a big plaque and they're covered in flowers. And that's why um, the majority of the AOS awards awarded to the species has been culture awards, so CCF. This particular one is certainly not qualified for a culture award, but it did get a quality award of HCC, yeah. ah. 79. 
Because if you look at the individual flowers, it's very quite large and quite flat. Very nice and clean colors. And that's why uh, the award. That Go one. to the camera. <laughs> On your back. Back, show the plant to the camera. So, Just a minute. Don't, 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 don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, many of you have yeah. very few. Okay. Can, we, can they see again? Here, oh, would you like? To... Unfortunately, can you guys see this? Closer. Yes. Unfortunately, we don't have very good lighting, so you can't really see the flowers very well. Well, we could if you just hold it there for a minute. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Now, yeah, I see them. Now we see them. There you go. You don't need the bright light. We see the flowers. They're beautiful. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, guys. Okay. There's Florence. Hey, Florence. I care. Did Lynn show the puppy this month? Yes, she did. <laughs> okay. Can I get a puppy for the show and tell in house? Give us some assistance with the show and tell here in person. Thank you, Bill. Okay, Bill's going to show us our show and tell. I'm controlling it now. Yes. And the nice part is if you put it right about there. Oh, oh. <laughs> sorry. Oh, there we go. Okay. You pick a spot and I'll move to it. Right there. I'm not moving. Uh -huh. So. That's better. Yeah. Chris Nieto brings in half gardenery guard. Gardnery? Gardnery? Gardnery, thank you. It's cute. I mean, I can't say I've ever had anything in a pot that small. Bloom. What do I think? It's in like an inch and a half pot. Okay. <laughs> It takes a while. Chris also brings another one with, you got to bring ones I can't pronounce, which is all of them. Dendrobium. Let me try. The name is literally bigger than the friggin' flower. <laughs> I mean, here's the see it. Look how long that name is there. Hold the plant steady. I'm trying, but it's a very, it's a very, tiny. It's a very <laughs> tiny plant. Each of those flowers is smaller than a pencil eraser. So they are tiny, tiny, tiny flowers. You can see that's my big old fat finger here. <laughs> so you can see how small those things are. Okay. Well, you want to save the battery on the sun? Is that flashlight? Of course. I'm a geek. I've got everything. <laughs> ah. Oh, you thought that was small. <laughs> the only way anybody in the room can see it is to look up at the screen, honestly. It is Sonorcus fragrance, and it is literally the whole plant is probably the size of a quarter. There we are. There you go. So it is a tiny little thing, purple, and of course, I'm afraid of. I'm, I'm afraid to inhale the entire thing, but I put it over my nose anyway. Gorgeous. It's tiny. Andrea, you should get one of that. Those yeah, little ones. Yeah. I like that one. Also brings in. There we go. Uh, oh, you're going to do it to me again. <laughs> Hemophilia flabellata. Right, Hemophilia flabellata. 
You're making these names up, right? <laughs> a lot of flub a lot of there. Best part is the leaves. Check out those leaves. Isn't that awesome? Beautiful. Wow. So, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what any of these things mean. You know, <laughs> you know me. I just like to breathe. That's why I made you do this. Okay. <laughs> Was that a terrestrial? Yes. Why is my book? Is that a, a, outside? It's native to China. Oh, okay. And I grow it outside year round. Oh, oh cool. cool. And then it's deciduous, and then okay. in the winter I keep it dry until it starts poking through uh, in the spring. Is it a bulb or just like a rising? It's a little corn, about the size of your pea. Okay, cool. Okay, it also brings in, let me hang it this slowly. Uh, Philanopsis tellu, which is Ludumaniana by Speciosa. Doesn't it have a scent? They would show up much better if you had a dark background. We're looking at them through the screen in background. Yeah. That's better. Much better. Much better. <clears throat> and turn okay. it a little bit so you see the flower. There you go. Perfect. There we go. Back. There we go. <laughs> okay. And then... No tag. No tag. Who's plan? Oh wow. No. Okay. So. A tag. Orangus. Just a little bit. Step back just a little bit. There, yeah. yeah Rangus <laughs> luteo alba. And then me looks perfect. I think that's good. Well, look, and you got a seed pot on it. Ooh. Was that on purpose? Yeah. Ah, okay. It's a secret. <laughs> Okay. And your name? I've got... Tom. Tom. Merrick. Merrick. Corey, the goose tea, and then milk. Sia. Tlob. Tolkien. These are beautiful. Do you have any Lord of the Rings? She loved, I don't know. <laughs> um, so this is my plant. Uh, the plant itself looks a little beat up. Uh, my top of my covered porch blew off in a freak windstorm Ooh. in like the middle of summer and scorched the entire plant. I thought I lost it. Oh. And then it, um, this so is my, good. my second bloom of it. Um, it had like one flower before and now it has three spikes. So nice. I'm pretty happy with it. Good. Some time for Halloween. <laughs> nice save. Rose from the dead. It did. Oh, and that does do now owes for two two prizes. <laughs> Bring, brings in <laughs> mini purple neon AMAOS. So it's already already awarded. Oh, so nice, nice, nice. It's not in the judging room. <laughs> I heard a lot about this over the last few meetings because of lots of various meetings because several different speakers talked about talked about these things. <coughs> this is Neophenetia falcata, now known as Vanda falcata. And oh Shudamania. Shoot. Shudemo. What he said. Can you see the flowers? Mm-hmm. And usually, yeah, a little bit of fragrance, but really cool. What's that? That's Jeff's plant. That's Jeff's plant. That's Jeff's plant. Well, and they, it, the pot is actually considered a big part of the whole display. So the pot, the color of the root tips, the way that the, the, it, the leaves match into the stem. Um, too crazy for me. Mm. 
plastic neophonesia pot. I've got a bunch of those, but I just put everything in wooden baskets now. <laughs> This one is oh, nice. Uh, Elsie Okorchi by Shilariana. Unfortunately, I brought it in for judging, but the uh, flowers have some chewed spots on them, so. The, the birds in the greenhouse really like to nibble on things, and well, <laughs> they found this one. I think that one's got a snail spot. Uh, I don't know if the color shows up in the mirror. Anyway. It's hard to see on the camera, but it has a really nice, like, shading to that darkened yeah. in the petals. Beautiful. Then, of course, I have. Cool. So. Uh, <laughs> hang on a second. Oh. Cool. <laughs> Down the stage. <laughs> okay. This is Catalina hybrida, uh, which is Gutata biolita GCI. Very, very, very early hybrid from like a million years ago, eighteen hundreds. The flowers. Are really, oh, where'd you go? There you are. It, they come in like really long spikes. So you can see a gigantic yeah. flowers. I mean, there's only three spikes, and one of them's kind of spent, but big long flowers, very, 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 very old hybrid. Is there a way to zoom on into that when you're showing it? Oh, yeah, you can zoom in. As much as I can get. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> Gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> the attack of the killer Talia. <laughs> so, that's it. Very okay. nice. Okay, next we have Connie. She's gonna come up for us. Let me get her. Oh boy. Bear with me, everybody. Yes, the slideshow going. <laughs> okay, I cannot get the bio but I will get it. Oh, here we go. Uh, Zoom call, can you see my screen? Yes. 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 Um, I'm just going to leave it for now because it's a little bit easier for me. All right, so Shawnee um, wrote us a lovely little bio here. Um, her talk's going to be on getting your orchid judged. Uh, you might believe that in order to have your orchids uh, deserve an AOS flower quality award or a cultural award, you must be a master orchid grower with hundreds or even thousands of orchids. Totally not the case. We're going to cover the steps to decide if you should enter your orchid for judging and what to expect when you have one of your orchids judged. Who are the people judging your orchids? Why would you want to have AOS awards? Why would you want to buy seedlings whose parents have AOS awards? How will understanding judging criteria make you happier with choices you make of your own collection? Shawnee has been growing orchids for more than 20 years and has killed more orchids than she currently owns. <laughs> that is a lot of experience. She grows a wide variety of orchids in an 8 by 16 greenhouse heated with two electric space heaters while personally trying to save PG&E from, from bankruptcy. <laughs> there is a mix of species and hybrids in the greenhouse, all loved equally. She is uh, a four or five year member of SOS, SFOS and a longtime member of Peninsula Orchid Society where she has been a perpetual board member as well as occasionally assisting with the Peninsula uh, Orchid Society newsletter and has served as show chair for uh, four times. Shawnee was recruited to join the Pacific Central Judging Center after some of the judges noticed that she worked like an Iditarod sled dog. Judging centers have administer, administrative duties, just as orchid societies do. 
She photographs some of the awards for PCJC and is sometimes proud, sometimes embarrassed to see her photos in Orchids magazine. You would think photographing something that can't run away from you and doesn't have to have a pleasant facial expression would be a slam dunk. Oddly, it is not. You see that was a lovely, really lovely answer there. Okay. So, yeah, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> Working on it, working on it. Okay. You guys should free the stretcher, you know. Yes, please. You've been sitting for a while. <laughs> I just had it in there. It's coming, the slideshow is coming. What, what are you seeing on the Zoom call? See, seeing the, uh, the main slide, but uh, there, there uh... is it green? Yeah. Part of it is. We we had it all and then now we lost it. We only have a little sliver of it. Two, one, nine, four, three, five. There we go. And we do have your notes on the side. Can you see it? Perfect. Yep. I can't see it here. <laughs> you guys can just all crowd around. Right? <laughs> Look over my shoulder. <laughs> now it's back to that sliver again. You had it perfect a minute ago working on it. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. No problem. Some of us couldn't even do this much. So <laughs> you have my respect. Well, <laughs> Now what do you see? Zoom call. Just a, <clears throat> your notes and a sliver. I see about a third of your, your presentation screen. We had it. Oh. Who's bought a orchid joke? <laughs> <laughs> Who's got tranquilizers? <laughs> 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 Yes. Okay. Perfect. So, how do we get it? So you're going to be eating from up here. Okay. How do we get them kind of out of there? There we go. Okay. We're going to be reading from here, and then we're going to have to look at these other things. Okay. So I can just like to change the space too much. Okay. Yes. I suggest you hang the camera at heart because I got Yes, I will. I will once I. <laughs> okay. We're good. 
All right, so the, is the camera okay? So this presentation was requested by Sandy Fox of Santa Clara Valley Orchid Society for their November meeting. Well, they'll be here next tomorrow. <laughs> but you're getting the world premiere. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so one thing you should realize is we're here to serve you. We're in our judging, we're not judging you, we're looking at your plants. We're here to serve you. The reason we show up every month, we want you to bring the plants in for judging. And we're really excited when we get to award them. If we have to screen something, we decide that we're not going to be able to probably award it, then we oftentimes spend more time discussing that plant than the ones we award, because we're trying to find some way to give it an award. <laughs> oh. Do I dare press that? <laughs> Okay. All right. All right. Two fingers. Okay. So tonight I'm going to talk about what is AOS judging? How do you decide if you want to enter a plant in AOS judging? You don't want it to feel like it's a total crapshoot. Why don't you take this in? I have not time to do this whole thing. Um, that doesn't really encourage you to come in very often. What happens at AOS judging? This is where Sandy's, um, Sandy came to by Lily and watched us judging. She had a lot of questions to put into the presentation. That was very helpful for me. There are a lot of things I just take for granted at this point. And what happens after AOS judging? How long have you been judging? Um, I think about nine years. Okay, what is American Orchid Society judging? It's a system. It's not God's word. It's not the best thing that ever happened, but it is a workable system. It took me a while to decide after I entered the judging program, does this really make sense? And after a while, I decided that yes, it does, so I stuck with it. But you have those first three or four years to be asking, is this what I want to do? Does this make any sense to me? So we're, it's judging nat nationally, and we're using a database of previous awards. Sometimes we're looking at previous awards of your orchid, or sometimes for your parent. Sometimes we just have to wing it. You've got something where there's not awardable or awarded parents. And we just have to figure out, is it good under our criteria? OK, so it's different than ribbon judging. You go to show your enter your catlia in, in um, three and a half inch or larger flower catlias. The judging team goes around. There's a pink one, there's a white one. This one has totally different shapes. And you have to figure out which one you're going to place first, second, third. It's much harder to judge that than to do the analyst. <laughs> Analyst judging, you're looking at exactly that species, exactly that breadth. That's what you're comparing it against. You're not comparing it against what apples and oranges. Yeah. Explain to people what Brexit is. Well, we'll get to Brexit after the too. Yeah. I'll show you. Okay. So, and then we're the name of your orchid, but we'll, we'll get to that pretty soon. And the judging center, the, um, Pacific Central Judging Center is the judging center for your area. It's both a place and a group of people. So the place is San Francisco or Philomo. Both of those are judging centers. But the people, the 17 people who belong are also the Pacific Central Judging Center. So it covers quite a bit. Okay, and then we have a website 
you always go check out our website. And who are the judges? Are they world renowned working experts? No. <laughs> no, those people are too busy to be doing that. And they would want men. So it's all volunteers. It's um, there are growers and there are hobbyists. So a wide variety of people with a lot of different experiences. So if you want to become a judge, you should be able to walk into a room, into a showroom, and say, go find this certain pathway. You should not be having to read the tag. Okay, so video, okay, epidendro. Now you should be able to go find the tap rooms and then read the tag. So, you know, that's, that's the level you should at least have reached to start in the judging program. You have to fill out a long application. You have an interview with three of the judges in the center, and you have to pass the color test. It's kind of a long test. It's one of those things where they have the dots, and if you can see the, the number, then, then you're doing good. So you're a judge for three to four years. That means you're clerking, you're um, practicing scoring, and you're giving presentations and doing research. So that's a time to figure out to learn the system. You know, so it's really about learning the system so that you can judge as a team. Because you all have to be on the same page when you're judging. So after that, you're promoted to associate judge. At that point, when you sit down and score your score count. But you are outnumbered two to one by the accredited judges. That's required for each team. For each associate judge on the team, there have to be two accredited judges. And they're responsible for running your judging center. All the business aspects, the, um, the, the chair has to go to the national JC judging center meeting twice a year. It's a requirement that the representative us there bring up any issues we have and uh, have to file reports with them. So what is eligible to bring in for judging? You need to own the orchid. You can buy it from Bill in the parking lot and bring it right in. <laughs> it's not like going to the orchid where you need to own your plant for six months. Unless you want a cultural award. Then you should have owned it for a year. You used to be six months. They changed that now. And you can enter a Maristan orchid where there are thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of the exact same orchid out there. But if it hasn't been awarded, you can bring it in. But you need to know, you actually need to know the Grex name, which is this name right here. So here's your genus, here's your Grex name, here's your clonal name. So you need to know that on a Maristan orchid. Because all those tens of thousands of orchids have the same clonal name. They're all considered to be the same orchid. And sometimes your tag has misspellings on it. I know you're shocked to learn this. <laughs> but you need to check on what is the actual name of your orchid. And it's good to know, find out what the parents are if you don't know, or to find out the registered name of the grex if you only know the parents. And there's no cost to enter your orchids for judging. If you get an award, that's when we get you. <laughs> All right, so checking species names. I like to use the Q World Checklist with this handy, easy to remember website. <laughs> so if you don't spell it correctly for Q, you're going to get no results on your search. So at that point, Try the internet. See if something close comes up. It looks pretty good. If that doesn't work, Ron Carson, <laughs> encyclopedia brain, can probably come up with your name for you. 
So here's what their website looks like. I put in, this was the label on my plant. It's a Lelia. Have to put in the whole thing spelled correctly. So then you say find name. Here it says names in bold indicate accepted name. This is not an accepted name. They're not in bold. So I clicked on the top one, Lelia Alorii. And then I get the accepted name. Why did they make you jump through quite so many hoops? I don't know, but this is what the way they do it. So it's actually Catlin in now. Big surprise. Checking hybrid names. I like to use the RHS register. They're the people that you register your cross with. So, so to me, the best place to go. Again, you have to spell it correctly. If it has an apostrophe in the name and you put it in correctly, it may still not give you your results. You have to find workarounds to get there. When you do finally get it, when you pull up um, the plant, they don't have the apostrophe in the name there. Why their search function doesn't work, I don't know. That'll drive you a little crazy. And if you can't find the correct way to spell it, how that form parts it for hybrid. Just forget that one. We'll just laugh at you. Okay, so this is what the RHS website looks like. I don't usually put the genus in, especially for cat news, or you don't know, is it Layla? Is it Papanamis? Is it cat Lea only? Is it our, you know, is it Rinko Lelia? Is it, you never know. So I just don't put that in. I only put in the, the Grex name, which here, so it's Catlia Walteriana crossed with Perforata, which is now Catlia Perforata. You put in Lelia Perforata, then that's going to ruin your search. So since they changed that to Catlia, so just don't even put the genus in. So then you click on search. And here on the left, you see it's called Papa Road. So you click on that and then you can see this other information. You can check and make sure the parents are the ones you meant to enter. And you can see who registered it, who was the breeder, when it was registered. Kind of interesting information. Use this and you'll be able to start picking out seedlings if you want, as you understand parentage a little better. So if you scroll down, you can also just put in the Grex. You know the Grex, but you don't know the parents. So search on that. Then it brings up Catlia Circle of Life. So now you know for sure it's a Catlia. And you can have the parents also. Okay, so tomorrow is orchid veggie. I want to see if I have anything I can take in. So I look around the greenhouse in the yard. Now this Sobralia, but this is day four. I know that I'm not gonna bother to take it in tomorrow. And I have this um, LC Miss Wonderful, but it fell over out in the yard and the snail got it. So don't take in your snail damage plants. Or if you see pets or you know ants, aphids, don't, don't bring them in for judging. Okay, so then I have these other three things in the greenhouse. I'm going to research them a little further. Son of a bitch. So, Catlia Marissa Kubo. Beautiful, beautiful color. It is dark pink. But I look at the parents. There is, it's not awarded. There isn't an awarded one. I look at the parents. Um, on Orchid Pro, I draw up, you know, some of the um, award plants, and I say, you know, these have really wide petals, and my plant does not have really wide petals, so this isn't going to catch. The color is great, but the shape is not going to make it. So I'm leaving that at home. And what about my Catlia aurei? Well, it's very cute. I see the awarded ones and it's very cuppy. And you can see that the awarded one 
here is also very heavy, but it's just a little more open than mine. So I would call mine typical and not awardable. Because we're looking for something that's a little better than average. So then I look at my CADS Vito. And I happen to know that I've already had the female flowers awarded on it. But I have the male flowers now. So this is on Orchid Pro. If you belong to the AOS, you have access to this. And you can look up previously awarded plants. And this is what the judges do to research your plant. This is where we go first. And then if we can't find things here, then we have to look farther afield. So I bring that up and I see the one award for female flowers on the top and one award for male flowers. So I'm going to compare mine, which is on the right, with the one that's been awarded. And I can see that this one has very flat um, petals. You know, this, it has a typical problem for catastrophes where they're very close together, but they're pretty flat. You look at mine, and I'm sorry, but they're, they're curved in at the middle. So that's going to be a demerit. <laughs> on the other hand, another problem you see on catastrophes is that the lateral sepals tend to be very puffy. And this is much flatter. So that's a good point. Then the lips are quite different. And it's hard to know what a consumer judges will think about the lips. So, okay, I guess I'll take it in and give it a try. It doesn't look too bad. Looks promising. So I also look at the measurements and I find my number of flowers is only nine. I'm going to lose points on peripherousness. The size of the flowers is about the same. So I check out the description after and the measurements. And I say, okay, I'm gonna take <laughs> this in for judging. So the next day I head over to Faloli. I have to go anyway. I'm gonna be judging there. So, you know, this is one reason why judges get so many awards. We have to go anyway. So let's go see what we've got in bloom and take it in. Maybe one out of three of my plants gets an award. But I'm going there anyway, and it's a matter of taking enough plants in after you've evaluated them. So here's the entry table. You can see that there are entry forms available here. The other plants are already entered. There's Jim. He's the, um, the chair for Filoli. So I fill out my entry form. I include the fact that it has a previous award and then it's, we're ready to go. So what happens now? The center chair assigns the judges to their team. You don't get to decide you're going to sit with Martha. No, that's not how it works. Center chair assigns people to the teams and then the first person they name when they call out the team is the team captain. And then the center chair decides which plants go to which team. You don't get to go choose which ones you want to go. You have them given to you. And we try to avoid conflict. Sometimes you end up with a plant that you have a conflict with at your table. So maybe you own the plant, maybe you sold it to someone. Maybe you gave someone a lot of advice on which plant they should take in to judge, and you've already told them they should take this one. In that case, you just keep your mouth shut. You don't do much in discussing the plant during this sort of discussion. And when you fill out your score sheet, you don't ask for a score. You just hand it in to the team captain, and no one knows that you have anything to do with that plant. Because it's supposed to be anonymous. We do our best. Sometimes we do know who owns the plant. So here's Jim bringing over a plant to our table. Um, we had two teams. We have one student judge on the left and then two judges plus 
I'm supposed to be sitting there at that computer. And here's the other team. So first research is done using Orchid Pro. If we can't find anything on Orchid Pro, the, this particular Rex has not been awarded before. Um, and the parents have not been awarded. Then we go to the internet because we need to have some idea of what this should look like. So there's usually something out there. Sometimes there's absolutely nothing. Then we just have to evaluate the flower on the form. Then the team decides what kind of awards to consider. Most common is flower quality or cultural. Then a variety of other awards too. I'm not going to go into all of those. <laughs> then I want you to wait before you, 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 know, you drive home. Um, all right, so then the team captain said after the entire discussion and done our research, does anyone want to record it? If people feel that it's not going to reach the minimum score, then they scream. You know, it might be flower damage, it might just be um, just, just the flower form isn't as good as, as what we're seeing on Electric Pro. So, you know, we can sometimes we'll look, okay, these are AM, is there room to make it into the HTC? So, if, if we feel we can't, get to the minimum four, we'll screen it. But if one person says I want a score, that's it, the score. So here's our score sheet. And everyone fills out their score sheet, signs it. If you're a student, you write up student so they don't count the score in case they don't realize you're a student. Um, because you are supposed to go judge at other judging centers also. You can see there is some differences in the way the, the points are balanced. And just because it says, okay, and the team captain tells you which category you're going to use. It's just because you have a path of heaven doesn't mean you're going to use that particular um, column because this is for path of heaven to the single flower. On the There's no score for in, for uh, foreverseness, and if you have a multi floral path, then that's not going to do well for that. Not be adequate for growing that plant. So various times you'll use some category that isn't the exact match. You actually have to have some idea of what you need to score on these different plants. So this is why it takes. <laughs> okay, then we also have the cultural score sheet. You'll see it's quite different. We don't have nearly as many little niggly boxes to consider each section of the flower. Um, and condition of bloom, you know, if you have every flower is perfect, then you might get bloom. You know, if you have a few that are fading, well, you know, 15, 18, somewhere in there. Depends on how many flowers you have on the plant. So here's, here's my team scoring. Um, after you score, you hand your sheet over, face down, no one's supposed to know what your score was, except for the team captain. They look and they say, is it within a six point spread? If so, all right, we average the score and that's your, your score. But if it's wider than six points, then the question is, okay, pass out the sheets back to each judge. Shall we discuss the similar word? Um, does anyone want to adjust the score? Because we're supposed to be looking at the team. It's our job to give your plant a score. If we just can't, someone feels very strongly one way or another, then it goes to another team. There's not another team that team better get it together and reach a compromise. So after the scoring is finished, the tedious part starts. Not for you, for the judges. Every part of the flower has to be measured. 
as a for cultural award, we measure the container, we write down the type of media, we measure the leaves, we picture the size of the whole planet. Um, all the flowers have to be counted. This can be an exciting time when we come to open some flowers. Because we get some fill brings in some pretty big things with lots of flowers. <laughs> some people bring in things with lots of little flowers. So students are often trying to ask to do the same thing. <laughs> okay, so after we're done, we write a description. We have to follow a strict format. We have to follow a very strict style sheet. Um, and then the plants taken to the photography area. If you bring in something with very delicate light colors that bruises easily, or you bring in something like a Stanhopia or a Stanhopa, or however you want to call it, there's a big debate over that. Um, you bring that in, and it's something that changes shape rapidly as it dries out. We may take the phone up first and then go to it. Some things don't last very long. They're very tender. And it's very hard. I mean, you tend to touch them before you're judging. So we do take that into account. If you're bringing something huge, Bill, <laughs> or if you're bringing a lot of them, the students can let the center chair know because if I'm going to take a photo and I know Bill's bringing something really big, I'll make sure I have all my really big backgrounds <laughs> and people lined up to hold them up or whatever I need. Because some things are not easy to photograph. Or you've got 25, we had um, Eric Phil bring over like 27 of his um, Phalaenopsis from Phoenix. Two day drive for him. He let us know he's coming. We made sure we had plenty of judges because. You know, that was at Oakland, and sometimes it might happen. So you can't do a good job on 27 plants in the evening with one team. So it's, you know, good to let us know if you're bringing something special or difficult. Okay, so then we send it in the information in the photo to the ALS. You get a bill. After you've paid your bill, your plant goes into the database and will be used in judging other plants. And you can get a copy of your photo from the photographer. You just have to ask them. John, how long do you have to pay for the award? I think you have a year. If you don't pay for your award, there's trouble. <laughs> Like they won't, you know, you'll be on the list of your plants that you get in the future. They're really very strict about that. Most people pay their awards. And you can always put on your plant if it's at a show and we might pull it out to judge. You can put on your plant, no ALS judging. And certainly if you have something that you're putting it in the show, because it's the show, but it hasn't reached its peak, then you should put no ALS judging. If you think that you want, you want to take it the next week, you know that they always judge it when it's at its peak. So you just you need to mark it, and then there won't be any issues about that. So, what happened with my entry? It received 81 points. Here is the here are the female flowers from that plant from two years before when I had that awarded. So you're always welcome to just come and watch. We're even more thrilled if you bring a plant. Uh, we have judging here every month. You guys are meeting and you're here. Um, also at Bailoli, which is a lovely place to go on the third Saturday of each month. And that's in the morning, which we really like. We like to have natural light to look at the flower. Colors are much better. So you can get in for free, but if you want to go tour the house and the gardens, then you need to get tickets before that. California, Sierra Nevada holds judging tomorrow. So Sacramento in the evening, so you can always go there with your plants. They've just started back on that. They have been in a brewery for the last two years, but they're going back to their regular judging. 
And of course, we have AOS judging at orchid shows. So if you take your plants to the orchid show and you say, well, this is nice. I hope they pick it out for AOS judging. Don't do that because there are lots of plants. We may not notice your plant. We don't have more parts of the encyclopedia available for this. And so if you fill out a nature we will be sure to look at it. It costs you nothing, and it keeps us from missing out on an awardable plant. Because lots of times we don't know how to the plant that is affordable. So go ahead and fill out those interviews. Don't be shy. Your plants are just as good as anyone else's. Okay, we also do outreach judging sometimes, but, um, and you can bring your plants there. You can bring your plants to judging at shows without them turning your plants in the show. Just bring them in when we're having the AOS judging, enter it, wait, and then you can take it home later. So there's lots of opportunities, and I hope some of you will consider bringing plants in. And thank you. Are there any questions? <laughs> Questions from Zoom. Oh, yeah, I got them. Oh, you can find them again this morning. Jeff does have the chat pulled up. If you have a question, you can put it in the chat. Cool. All right. Well, thank you, John, for doing that. I hope we all have a plant in soon. Um, so we'll see you next month. <laughs> yes, many more entries, hopefully next month. Um, any other announcements? I think there was one announcement from Karen in the chat. Jeff, do you have that? Cool. So I thought it's in the chat, um, but we will get that information out as well. Thank you, Karen, for that. Um, we have the County Jungle event this month or next month, excuse me. I'll send out more info on that. And I think that's all the announcements I have for the end, but thank you all for coming. And Raffle. Raffle, thank you. I know it's for something. The oh. question is how does judging impact the value of your plant? Well, that kind of that depends. <laughs> <laughs> it won't cause it to go down. But um, one thing you'll see is you'll notice that Fred Clark breeds mainly with awarded plants. And you get a lot better quality plants from that type of breeding. So he has a pretty consistent program going forward. Um, as to whether you can sell your plants or more, well, certainly um, I bought a division of Massa Valley Red Shine from Asuka. And then he put in the main piece of the plant for judging. It was at an outreach judging. He received an FCC on it. He came over and told me I needed to pay him more for my division. Right? Ah! <laughs> so it may be that the value is in the um, eye of the owner. Sometimes it does actually have some effect. Um, certainly, in general, unless Bill owns it, FCCs tend to be hardier 
Many hands are raised in the participants section. This is what I wrote in the chat. So there's a room here we're doing a raffle of the $20 uh, mm -hmm. price of the clothes. So we'll do it now. I don't think that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So the, we have the ten twenty dollar tiny jungle zip codes to give out. So I have texted in the chat I ask people to raise their hands if they want. So in the room, if you're interested in being in the raffle, raise your hand so I can put you in the list and then we're gonna try to do it on the computer. Yeah. Jeff, check check participants. That's where the hands are raised. You can see them on the screen, thank you. Andrea. Yes, I'm here. I raised. So we will email you if you are a winner with your info. Thank you. Yeah. 
pills and insulin, but the lips and the degrees, which are the you know, some people are more over, some people are more over the for others, which is really important. Okay. Are we taking questions from people with their hands raised? Okay, we got all the hands raised. I think that is it for the, where am I? <laughs> that is it for the Zoom call. So we're going to hang up on you. Um, thank you so much for coming. And we'll see you next month. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye, Zoom. Good night. Bye. Good night. <laughs> 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 <laughs>